Welcome to part four of Understanding Lead Acid Batteries. I'm calling this episode, What Batteries Care About? We're going to discuss the different environmental factors and use factors that affect the length of time a battery will last, as well as how much current you can get out of that battery. Back in part three, we discussed battery capacity. Things like reading the spec sheet on a battery like this one, as well as all the different ways batteries are rated. And we discussed the testing methods that each capacity rating describes. Here's where we run into a common misconception. Since this battery is marked as 77 amp hours, it's easy to assume this battery will always give me 77 amp hours no matter how I use it or where I use it. In truth, the only time you'll get 77 amp hours is when you start with a fresh, fully charged battery. It's 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're pulling 3.85 amps out of the battery. I explained all this in part 3. If you change any of these factors, that amp hour rating is no longer valid. Here's why. Looking at the specific values in each of these tests, they all have something in common. Time, voltage, and temperature. Let's talk about the time factor. In reality, what we meant to say was time and current since time is used to measure how much current you're pulling out of the battery. The rule here is, the faster you draw current out of a battery, the less current will be available from that battery. For example, let's say we have a battery rated at 100 amp hours. That rating was achieved by pulling 5 amps out of the battery for 20 hours. If you increase your current draw to 14 amps, the battery will be dead in 5 hours and you only get 70 amp hours out of it. Or even more extreme, 65 amps will give you 1 hour of use of the battery, meaning your battery is dead after only giving you 65 amp hours. There's actually a formula out there that allows you to calculate these values. But rather than explain this formula, let me show you something different. Here we have a battery. Inside of that battery, there's a very small amount of resistance to electricity flow. The most basic formula in electronics is Ohm's law. It will tell us the relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. We don't even have to do math to use this formula. Let's say I want to find out what voltage is dropped across the resistance inside the battery. Well, the formula states, if the resistance is constant and the circuit current increases, then the voltage dropped across the resistor must go up. Knowing this information, we can tell that when there's no current flowing from the battery, all of the battery's voltage will be available at the output posts. Okay, let's hook up a load to the battery. The battery voltage will be felt across the load inputs. Current will now start to flow. Uh, you may be saying, now wait a minute, everyone knows current only flows in one direction in a DC circuit. Why'd I draw it in both directions? Well, the reason is because I don't know who's watching this video. You see, technicians state current flows from negative to positive, while engineers state current flows from positive to negative. A future video of mine, I'll probably show why engineers are wrong. But for right now, just understand the circuit works either way. As a small amount of current starts to flow, According to Ohm's law, the resistance inside the battery will start dropping just a little bit of voltage. And any voltage dropped inside the battery is unavailable at the load. Notice load voltage drop from 12.7 to 12.5. If you want to pull more current, reduce the size of the load resistor. Notice the voltage drop inside the battery went up again. Large currents can even drop your output voltage to 10.5 volts. Now that we understand why the output voltage of a battery changes under load, we can finally clarify some confusing information back on the capacity chart. Remember back in part 3? I said a battery is considered dead at 10.5 volts. So how in the world do we drop all the way down to 7.2 volts for cold cranking amps? It's because the battery is under load. There's so much current being pulled from that battery that the battery itself is dropping 5.5 volts inside of it. And when a resistor drops voltage like this, that excess energy is turned into heat, which leaves less current available for the battery to give up. So, to recap the two things we've learned, we now know why the faster you draw current, the less current you can get out of a battery, as well as when you're checking the health of a battery by measuring voltage, make sure the battery is not under load. Now that you know a rating of 100 amps doesn't necessarily mean 100 amps, this presents a little bit of a design problem. Here's why. In a perfect world, it's going to take you 20 hours to discharge that battery. In this case, you have no problem. You'll get 100 amp hours. But what if you drain the battery in 10 hours? This means you're pulling too much current, so you'll need to buy a bigger battery just to get that 100 amp hours. At this rate, you only get 90% of the desired current. So to replace the missing current that you need, 
divide your desired current by 0.9 or 90 percent. This means a 111 amp hour battery will give you 100 amp hours at that rate. Let's go ahead and finish out this chart. Let's move on to voltage. A fully charged battery with no load is 12.7 volts. 11.6 volts is considered discharged. And 10.5 is considered a dead battery. Go ahead ask. I know you want to, because I did. What the heck's the difference between a dead battery and a discharged battery? Well, a discharged battery can just be hooked up to a charger and recharged. No problem. Well, a dead battery will pretty much ignore your charger unit. It would require the services of a professional performing some sort of magic to bring it back to life. And here's the really neat thing about voltage. You can use voltage to determine how much capacity is left in your battery. There are dozens of charts just like this one on the internet. The actual values seem to differ just a little bit, but this is the most popular one that I found. Here's how the chart works. With no load on the battery, measure the voltage across the terminals. Find your voltage, then move across to the left column. It'll tell you the remaining percentage of charge left in that battery. For example, 12.5 volts means 80% of your battery is left. In addition to the percent of charge, the different colors on this chart can tell you whether or not you're mistreating that battery. Lead acid batteries absolutely do not like to be deeply discharged. And every time they are deeply discharged, it shortens the life of that battery. If you constantly discharge down to the red, 11.6 to 11.8 volts, you'll at least know that pretty soon you'll be buying a new battery. A little easier on your budget is run the battery in the yellow zone, 11.9 to 12.2 volts. There's no doubt yellow is much better than red. There is, however, some conflicting information. I have found some websites say it's fine to run the battery down to the 50% mark. Other websites disagree with that. However, they all agree that best practice is to only take it down to the 70% charge. This is known as shallow cycling, and it will give you the longest life for the battery. Is there a way to size your battery so you don't drop below the 70% mark? Let me show you what I found on the internet. They state if your load is 100 amp hours, simply add a 70% buffer below that. 70% is the same as multiply by 0.7. You get 100 amp hours times 0.7 equals 70 amp hour buffer. Add your buffer to the original load, you get 170 amp hour battery required. For all you math whizzes, let me show you a real quick shortcut. We know 0.7 will give you 70%, so 100% would be the same as multiplying by 1. 1 plus 0.7 gives you 1.7. So now we know if we multiply by 1.7, we'll get our original number plus a 70% buffer. We got the same 170 amp hours as we did with our original mathematics with fewer steps. Hmm, that sure sounded nice. And I saw this process on three different websites, so it's got to be right, doesn't it? Let's check. From our calculations, we have our 170 amp hour battery. We pull our 100 amp hour load out of it. That leaves our battery with a 70 amp hour charge. 100 amp hours is 59% of the battery. 70 amp hours is 41% of the battery. Clearly our 41% charge doesn't meet our 70% required level. So instead of trying to figure out what's wrong with these other websites, I decided to fall back on my third grade mathematics teachings. That would be calculating percentages. I don't know how big the total battery is going to be, but I do know a load of 40 amp hours would be 30% of that number. This leaves me a comfortable margin of 70% reserve. Our formula? Load divided by the percent of the battery used equals the total size of the battery. So in this case, 40 amp hours divided by 0.3 means we have a 133 amp hour battery. You always want to check your work, so our battery reserve amp hours will be the total battery, 133 amp hours, times 70%. We have 93 amp hours. Adding your reserve 93 amp hours to your original 40 amp hour load does indeed give us a 133 amp hour battery. I think we've done the mathematics to death on that one. Let's move on. We can now use the math we just learned to calculate the financial economics of the battery we need to purchase. We create a list. Here's our reserve capacities. And as we saw earlier, divide the load out by 30% to find out our battery size. Here's the divisors for the other reserve ratings. Now do the math to fill out the table. Now that we have real batteries to work with, a quick search of the internet can give us some prices. In this case, I now know a 70% reserve could be a little pricier than I wanted. But I could probably afford a 50% reserve. 
Before I move away from voltage, let me cover two more points. You want to try to keep your battery as fully charged as possible. The lower the voltage on a battery, the less current will flow from that battery, which means it'll take longer to perform the same work. And actually storing a battery in a discharged condition will cause damage to it. Finally, let's take a look at temperature. Deep cycle batteries are rated at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. As the temperature drops, available current from the battery will also drop. On the other hand, as temperature increases, the battery will give you more current. Off the top of your head, that sounds like a great idea, but there is a drawback. Higher temperatures cause batteries to die sooner. This explains why a battery rated with hot cranking amps at 80 degrees puts out more current than a marine battery rated at 32 degrees. And finally, the automotive battery rated at 0 degrees has the lowest current rating. So how do I find out what current I'm going to get at the temperature I'm operating at? That's right, you guessed it. More math. Scour the internet long enough and you'll find this chart. Temperature correction factors. On this chart we'll find multipliers for a large number of different temperature ranges. Here's how you read it. The left column has the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. This is for the Americans. The next column is the same temperature but in Celsius. This is for the rest of the world. And finally, your correction factor. Here we see at 77 degrees you multiply by 1. That coincidentally gives you the same amp hours you started out with. That was too easy. Let's try to do one at 60 degrees. My battery is rated 150 amp hours at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Find 60 degrees on your table. Your correction factor is 1.110. Multiply it out. This tells me if my battery is stored at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, in order to get 150 amp hours out of it, I'll need to purchase a 166.5 amp hour battery. I'd like to point out one other fact about this table. Please notice in the table notes that despite the fact that you can get more current at higher temperatures, they recommend you never derate your batteries. For example, correction factor for 80 degrees Fahrenheit is 0.98. They're saying don't do the multiplication with this number. Just stick with your original battery size. Well, that's about it. In the last 12 minutes, I hope I've given you a better understanding of how to actually interpret what this number really means. Thanks for watching.